acknowledge Jesus as Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Good morning. Today we are here to finish the season of Epiphany. Today we are facing a long journey, no less than Israelites spending 40 years walking through the desert, dealing with uncertainty and fear, and also with their faith. On the Sunday like this, the Sunday of Transfiguration, and transfiguration means transformation. In the case of Jesus, it means that he was transformed, actually transfigured, and we will learn more about that today. So if you want to experience transformation, if you want to know more about yourself, more about what you're capable of when God is behind you, carrying you, helping you to be where you need to be according to God's plan. Do you want to know what you are created for? Do you know what you are able to do? Do you know what is there for you that you never ever experienced, but you sense it from your childhood? Welcome to Francis Street First. Today is the day of transfiguration, and it is possible that one day you will experience that transformation if you just jump one day when God calls you to make that jump. Welcome to Francis Street First United Methodist Church, and let's start worshiping God. My name is Kay, and as we enter into the worship on this day, make us like Jacob, wrestling with the angel of the Lord. We won't let you go until you bless us. Make us like the woman who kept appearing before the unjust judge. God, we are going to keep coming and worshiping and praying until our souls find their rest in you. Make us like the woman with the issue who would not give up. We are going to press our way until we can touch the hem of your garment. 
Lord, give us the new vision. Bless us with new resources. Lord, we want to the portion of the eldest child. Pour us out a double portion of your spirit to do your job in our community. Can we have an opening prayer? Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion illuminates the world. Transform us into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humility so that we may share in his divinity. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who live and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became a dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Last Sunday, we talked about Abraham, who was called by God to lead his family, to leave everything that he knew, to lead his family, his closest family, to where God will show him to go. As we talked last Sunday, God did not say, I will give you the kingdom, or I will give you the new house. I will give you a perfect land where you will become a rich man. It will be much easier, don't you think, to know that if I jump, if I leave everything behind, if I let things go, just like we talked last Sunday, then I will have the great land, I will have the new house, I will have a wonderful family, I will be healthy and wealthy, and I will live for a long life, and I will be happy. It's easy, but God does not work that way. God called Abraham out of the comfortable life, out of the life that he knew, out of the life where he knew everybody around him. He called Abraham into the unknown, and to go into the unknown requires to take a leap of faith. I remember when um, I was just 33 years old and God called me out of my normal life, secure life. The life of uh, a woman, a young woman with two children married and uh, having a very good job and God called me to start the church. To start the what? To start what? In the country where we have one religion which is Orthodox that is safer, comparing with Protestant churches, but especially in the culture where a woman cannot serve God. So for me to hear that voice of God, you need to start my church in your city was equal to insanity. 
I invite you today to think about your life. I invite you to think about the change that maybe you ponder in your heart, and it could be the change of your work. I know many people, like many years ago myself, that I love my job in a way, but I was not completely content. I sensed within myself that something is calling me out, something is giving me this hope that there is more in life than this job. I had a great salary. I was very, very happy in a way, but at the same time, something was terribly missing in my life. And this is when God found me and called me out. I invite you today to think about that day when you hear the call, or maybe you will hear the call if you did not hear it yet. And like me, like myself, many years ago, I was horrified just thinking about the jump that I'm about to make, the jump from the old into the new, the jump that did not give me any sense of direction. All I've heard was follow me. Seriously, it was just do what I said. I remember my sister told me, Lydia, you will end in prison. You will not survive. Step away. Stay safe. You cannot do that. You are a woman. You are the mother. You have two children. It is not safe for you to start something like that. But I was already swept by this calling of God and the promise. And I just stepped into the swirling wild water, trying to do something that I had no idea how to do it, how to start a church, how to lead people. Will they even follow me? What should I tell them? Should I preach? I should preach. Oh, I never did that. Should I pray? They expect me to pray for them. They look at me like I know something, but I didn't. This September, on September 21st, 2021, it will be 30 years since that service when I was ordained in Russia and people who knew me were amused, excited, but others were grumbling. Didn't she come from the same background as we did. Is she any better than us? And of course I was not, because all I knew that God called me out of where I was and required me to follow him. And that came with change and with risk, but it came only because of the leap of faith that I had no idea how it is called, but something made me jump. Methodist Church are packed and ready for the Russians. A Russian cargo plane arrives at Barksdale tomorrow to take away 80 tons of donated food and medical supplies. Most of it came from local churches and civic groups, but others donated as well. The outpouring of help has been tremendous. Uh, we've had medical equipment come in from as far away as Florida and Kansas, and we've gathered that here and prepared it for shipment that's being included. Now, the plane leaves Barksdale Friday for Ekaterinburg. The trip is expected to take 14 hours. The Russian AN-124 cargo plane arrived under cover of darkness, but its mission no secret, certainly nothing sinister, just a bit delayed. But once on the ground, the work began. All morning long, Barksdale airmen and their Russian counterparts loaded the AN-124 with the food and medical supplies collected throughout North Louisiana by Methodist churches and other civic groups. Now, despite the heavy lifting, the Barksdale airmen considered the work satisfying, but couldn't help notice the differences between the Russian cargo plane and the U.S. KC-10 cargo carrier. The cargo carrying capability of the KC-10 involves a roller system for ease of loading on the aircraft. The AN-124 has a flat uh, floor surface. We don't have the rollers, so we're using uh, forklifts and having to floor load everything onto the airplane. It's much needed supplies. Everything that's going over there, food staples, medical equipment, medical supplies, much needed. And I'm glad to see it going over there. For me personally, it's uh, 
all this cargo is not uh, any uh, of great importance than uh, the relationship between two nations. So between the ordinary people, it, the uh, friendship. We now have pictures of the unloading. After several delays, the transport plane finally made it. Ekaterinburg is the Russian city targeted for the nearly 80 tons of supplies. It's a city of nearly 1.5 million people situated within the Ural Mountain Range. Reverend Dwight Ramsey returned from the mission late Wednesday night. Oh, it was a great moment. Uh, the culmination of a lot of prayers and hard work by many people. It was a very moving moment to see that. I saw the distribution of some of that food, and it was well received. They need it. Have you ever seen a, someone cry when they got a five-pound bag of sugar? Food on board that Russian cargo plane was given out last week to a Katerinburg's oldest and poorest. Their reactions to the sugar, dehydrated soup, and powdered milk were heart-wrenching. As members of the Ekaterinburg Methodist Church explained to this woman how to use the food she was getting, she began crying. Thank you, thank you, she says, and breaks down. That scene was to be repeated throughout a very long day. Many, if not most, of the Russians who got food boxes had never received any help before. This food was unexpected and needed. This elderly woman was helped to stand up so she could thank the only American in the room, the photographer. God bless you. Spasiba, thank you, she says. And thanks to all Americans for helping us in World War II. Crews from the church visited some sad places. This woman lives in a one-room apartment with her 18-year-old invalid daughter. Listen to her daughter's reaction to a chocolate bar. One by one, the cooking oil and pasta, rice, soup and sugar are pulled out of the box until it becomes too much for the mother to bear. And in another case, a woman looks at the tea and flour but cradles the sugar in her lap afraid almost to let it go. And that's when, when I think about what made me jump was my baptism. Remember back in January, we had the service that is called Baptism of the Lord. And during that service, we were reminded about our baptism. We were reminded of our promise. Remember the words, remember your baptism and be faithful. And to be faithful to the Lord means only one thing, to act with faith when God calls us to do God's job. We are the eyes and the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And where, Lord, where the Lord goes, we are called to go. In the most difficult places, the places of poverty, the places of injustice, the leap of faith is not something when God tells you, follow me and I will give you A, B, C, D, or I will give you everything you desire, or follow me and I will fulfill every wish you have. That does not work that way. And we know the story of Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, about Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Before they crossed the Red Sea, remember how much time Moses spent trying to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. It would be much easier, first of all, if Pharaoh was agreeable, but Pharaoh was very stubborn. He did not want to lose this free labor performed by thousands and thousands of men and women. So what all we know from the Bible that 600,000 men left Egypt. So they left slavery, but not willingly. It cost them a lot of thinking. 
and Moses, trying to call them out of slavery, used all his words, though, as we know, he was not really a great speaker, Aaron was, but Moses tried to convince them that God will show us the way, God will show us the promised land, God will take us to the promised land, but Israelites preferred to die in slavery. It, because it was familiar, because it was not comfortable, but it was more secure than to go to the unknown. And so we hear the story of Israelites coming to the Red Sea, and then imagine they already were grumbling that they had to leave those pots with meat. So now they're facing the sea, high sea, and then on the back, there is no way to turn back because Egyptians, the army of the Pharaoh was chasing them. So the only option was for them to die, to be captive again, to go back to the exile or to die in that Red Sea. So there were 12 tribes, if you remember. And we know the story, how God told Moses, when Moses cried out to God to use his rod and split the sea. So here is the challenge. On one hand, if we know that we can step into the sea where the sea is already split and we see the dry land and this is a way to security, easy. But that's not how it happened. And we do not have this story in the Bible, but in the book of Midrash, which is like a thousand year old writing that Jewish rabbis use for teaching. So in that book, in the collection of stories, there is a legend. All we know that Nachshon from that legend, he stepped deeper and deeper and deeper into the Red Sea. And now the water came up to his waist, and then up to his chest, and then up to his neck, and then started going higher and higher. And the water became turbulent and dangerous, and Nakshon knew that the only way for him was either to turn back or to continue going. And right at this moment, Moses hears the command from God, strike your road and split the sea, and the sea split, and the water separated, and then Nakshan was safe, and then people started following him. You see, that's the difference. The difference between stepping into the sea when you see already the dry land, or like in the case of Nakshan, stepping into the water where there is no direction, but the promise of God that God will take you to the right place, to the promised land, and you will have everything changed. Everything will become new. Your life will be transformed. But that fear that really paralyzes us, paralyzed all these 600,000 Israelites who left Egypt. And the Bible says there were only Males. So 600,000 males converts into more than a million people because they were women and children. But that's how the Bible counted people by males. So 600,000 males were near the sea, being afraid to step into the water and follow Nakshon's example. They waited for the guarantee. That's why it took Israelites 40 years to wander in the desert because they were stubborn, they were afraid, they were complaining, and they did not want to give up the comfort and the security of the previous slavery that they hated. They were not happy in that slavery, but they did not want to change it for something unknown. We need to remember from today's gospel reading, from chapter nine, the story of Christ's transfiguration. We have to understand that this is the most important story 
and this is the most important moment in Jesus' ministry, when all he was prepared for suddenly came to the climax, and he had been transfigured. And remember how his clothes that we just heard from the reading that Candy Sheehan read for us, that his clothes suddenly looked different. It became dazzling white, blinding those who saw his transfiguration, who witnessed that moment. And this moment is so important that it is told in three Gospels, in Matthew chapter 17, in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, and in the Gospel of Luke, also chapter 9. So this story is very important, and it had been witnessed by three men. But think again about how we humans have this tendency to immediately look for something comfortable and secure, even during this moment when Peter, James, and John witness transfiguration of Jesus. They immediately thought of themselves. They thought, it is good for us to be here. You see, they forgot about the people. Jesus tried to lead and invited to follow him. Just three of us. But as soon as they saw Moses and Elijah, they wanted to be there in the presence of the divine and say, why don't we just stay here and make three tabernacles?
we come to the time of offering, time of giving, time of giving of ourselves, time of giving our resources, time of looking inside of ourselves. And though we know we have limited resources, but also thinking about God's creation, thinking about the stories of those people who gave everything they had. And just last night, I saw a dream that woke me up at two in the morning. It was a strangest dream, but in the dream, I invited a wonderful author to speak in our church. And then at the end of the meeting, one of the ladies I never met before came to me and she says, where is this guest of yours? And I have something for him. And I said, oh, he unfortunately left. And she said, oh, I wanted to give him my whole income for this month. And it was $2,000 that she wanted to give him. And I thought, well, why don't you give it to our church, to our ministry? And in my dream, I tried to convince her that this author that we invited, he is a guest and he's a wonderful author, but he does not need this $2,000. But what our church does, working with the poor, serving uh, at the soup kitchen, having the youth ministry, trying to uh, have these worship services, going to as many people as possible, I tried to convince her to think of our church and donate this money, not to one person, but to give it to the ministry that we try to do with the poor, not for the poor, not for them, but with them. Because when we think about offering stories, I think what is most inspiring, when we think about people we helped, but not just helped, like a handout, but helping them in a way that changes their lives. The lives need to be changed, and to give in just lunch is not enough. What we need to inspire people, we need to inspire people to change their lives. And without working with the poor, without knowing what they need, without knowing their names, without knowing the names of their children, where they live, the circumstances that led those families to poverty, we will never be able to help. And the more people, just like this woman in my dream, still, uh, was excited. She realized the difference. She realized that to be a part of the movement, to be a part of change with all her resources would be a much more important change in her life than just giving uh, $2,000 to a wonderful and famous writer. So I invite you today to think about giving, giving for the purpose, giving to the cause, giving in the name of change, that change that will also lead you to change. Because when we work with other people, when we sit down with them and hold their hands and hear their stories, it affects us and our lives are going to change too. So let's give in the name of the one, the one who sat with the poor, who ate with the prostitutes and tax collectors, the one who did not count the cost of his ministry that led him to the cross and the cost of that ministry of Jesus' work with the poor cost him life, life on the cross. And for us, it is much easier. We don't have to die on the cross because Christ died for us all. But what we are called to do is to serve, to love, to listen, to change, and to lead others to that change that should transform this whole world, transform God's creation, clean the air, change us all, change humanity, and change us, each of us. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask you to bless our giving today. We give in the name of the one who calls us to change, calls us to transformation, calls us to love, calls us to forgive 
and calls us to get involved because without involvement, we will not know who we are. Without knowing what we are capable of, we will not join you in your eternal kingdom. Lead us, inspire us, O oh God. Call us by each name of each person who is watches our streaming today. Bless us, O oh Lord, and bless our giving. Amen. So now when we are facing land, we are thinking about all people in our congregation who are sick, people who are aging, people who are not here, and lots of people get unemployed. Thousands and thousands of people experience this change that was inevitable, that caused not by their poor performance, not caused by something that they did, but simply by the circumstances. And uh, what will happen to those people? Will they have enough food for their children, for themselves? We don't know, but we pray for them. And in the coming week, will it be a doctor's visit, facing something unknown, losing a job, losing marriage, losing friends, having to move, whatever it is, we pray for you and we lift up your names today. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church.